everyone, my name is Eva Demjanovic and I'm the moderator for this panel called uh, Reptiles, Birds and Mammals. Oh. Um, just to introduce myself uh, very quickly, I'm uh, with Humane Society International Canada uh, and I'm a campaign manager. Um, Humane Society International Canada is a, one of the largest animal protection groups in the world. We work on a variety of issues touching all animals. Um, basically, our aim is to improve animal welfare and confront cruelty all over the world. Um, here in Canada, my role is to work on companion animals, so mostly um, cats and dogs for my, um, uh, when it comes to my campaign. Um, just recently, we've been involved in a campaign in South Korea where we uh, rescue dogs from a dog meat farm. So um, we, uh, we brought, um, just two weeks ago, 50 dogs that are uh, confined on uh, cruel dog meat farms where they basically um, have uh, very little to, to live on. Um, so these dogs are currently at an emergency shelter here in Montreal. So, um, I have a question. Yes. We read in the newspapers that they now illegal. What does that mean? Um, it's actually uh, one farmer that was uh, prosecuted for cruelty in a region in South Korea. So um, there's a judge that determined that the way the animals were kept and killed was actually cruel. So he was um, convicted of cruelty. So this is a huge win for us because it's a pre precedent in the, in the law for, for this type of facilities. Um, it's just, you know, um, uh, society moving forward and the law actually looking into this and determining that it's, um, that it's cruel. In South Korea, the, um, the particularity is that um, dog meat farming is completely unregulated. So there's abso absolutely no laws covering it. So anything can go on a dog meat farm. Um, so that's why it's such a huge issue and we see so much atrocities um, on it um, because there's no system that actually oversees what's, what's going on in there. So it's a huge victory for animal protection groups for sure. If no one else would say it, I'll say it. it's wonderful what you're doing. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so for this panel, uh, we want our uh, guest speakers, which you've all heard uh, today, to maybe summarize their, um, their topics and uh, um, just go over um, what they've discussed um, five minutes each. And then afterwards, our goal is to have some interactions um, between the speakers, but also uh, with you. So if you have any questions, if you want to participate, uh, please do so. You can use the uh, microphones on each side to ask your questions. Uh, it's, uh, it's better if you do because uh, we are um, um, streaming this online, so if we want people to hear, it's better to use the, the microphones. Um, so we're, maybe we're going to start by the end of the table with uh, John Segata just um, summarizing his topic. Hi everyone, hi again. Um, so just a quick summary. So I, I study songbirds and I my talk was on thinking about how the social audience could affect the structure of vocalizations and to what degree the social influences on uh, vocal production or any kind of communication in general could potentially lend insight into particular cognitive processes in animals and uh, just to think about these different ways to th think about audience effects on behavior and just to be somewhat thought-provoking about the ways in which we can study uh, animal communication. So I'm Greg Burns and I spoke to you about dogs this morning. Um, so uh, to try to summarize the research, basically the idea uh, is to train dogs to go in the MRI scanner so that we can see how their brains function under various paradigms. Um, the project started, you know, as, as I said, kind of as a side project and a proof of principle and kind of quickly grew from that. So the, the, where we are right now is we're basically using paradigms that are used in humans in the scanner and adapting those to be used in dogs as best we can uh, to try to understand not only how the dog's brain works, um, because they can't speak to us directly using uh, human language, uh, but essentially indirectly by peering directly into their brains. And so by using human studies, uh, or studies that have been done in humans, 
that provides a common link uh, to, to essentially match patterns of activity that we see in a dog's brain under the same circumstances that we see patterns, similar patterns of activity in a human under the same conditions. Um, so that's kind of the general paradigm that the project has evolved into. And the one thing that, that you know, I probably would like to talk about more on the panel, uh, which I touched upon, is the question of individuality. Uh, so over and over again, uh, in every study that we do, we find how different the dogs are from each other. Um, not so much in behavior, because we're not really studying behavior, but in how their brains behave. Um, and then to the extent that we can link that to aspects of behavior, we do find, find correlates. So, so this is, issue of individuality is, is of great importance to me now. I'm uh, Gordon Burkhart, and uh, I sort of felt that I had two main uh, goals uh, in my, my presentation. The first was to introduce a little bit of some of the ideas of uh, the early ethologists, and particularly Jakob von Juxko, and the concept of the functional circle that I think is critical uh, to so much of what we're doing, particularly in studying communication. And I followed that up by uh, developing the idea of critical anthropomorphism as a way of uh, avoiding the bad, you might say, anthropomorphism uh, tendencies, uh, but not throw the baby out with the bathwater, as it, as it were, and that we are as sentient beings who have our own reaction to environments, our own solutions to events in the environment, and we could use that to give us guidelines to how we can interpret and look at the behavior of, uh, of other uh, species. Um, and I advocated for a fifth aim of ethology then to actually focus on uh, von Eusko's inner world, the personal experience of animals. And then uh, I had the difficult job perhaps of applying that to animals that are considered to be historically sort of just sort of instinctive, uh, cognitively deficient uh, animals, uh, reptiles. And I tried to uh, bring together uh, the findings of my, my laboratory, but also many others, uh, that uh, are challenging this view. Uh, and the change in attitudes uh, scientifically has been slow, publicly probably almost non-existent, uh, when we see the views that people still have of, uh, of, of snakes and so on. Although turtles, people do love turtles. They, uh, they, they have more uh, uh, positive emotions <laughs> than uh, crocodiles or, uh, or pythons, like those who swallow people uh, have. <laughs> But uh, so I've tried to sort of focus on a variety of different topics in, in cognitive uh, and uh, um, effective kinds of problem solving, uh, individuality, uh, various topics that we've touched on already in, in this meeting and probably will be throughout the course uh, much more so, but tried to sort of show how some of the examples from reptiles fit into all these uh, issues. Hi, I, uh, I'm Kristen Andrews. I'm speaking tonight, so you haven't met me yet. Um, but I'm a philosopher. I may be adopting a Korean dog. Oh. And, um, but now I kind of want to get a bearded dragon to play with <laughs> the Korean dog. Um, I'm, a, I'm a professor of philosophy at York University, and I've been working in the philosophy of animal minds for many years. I've had a lot of experience working with non-human animals and human animals. Um, doing some of the science, because as a philosopher of science, I think you actually need to do uh, a little bit of the science. So I worked with um, Lou Herman's Dolphin Cognition Lab when that was running, doing some work on gestural communication, comprehension in the bottlenose dolphin, and um, analogical reasoning in the dolphin. I did some work during my PhD on children and the false belief task. I'll be talking to you tonight about the false belief task and some of the recent findings in uh, great apes uh, that suggest that great apes pass the false belief task. Uh, I work with orangutans in Borneo with my colleague Ann Russin, from, uh, also from York University. She's been in Borneo for 40-some, no, 20-some years now. A long time. A long time. Um, doing work with rehab orangutans and now also with wild orangutans. And we published a paper on gestural communication in orangutans. So I study animal cognition and philosophy of animal minds 
from a methodology perspective, where I look at the methods that we use in order to study animal minds and properties. I'm interested in questions and concerns about anthropomorphism. Really like this idea of the critical anthropomorphism. I've used that in my writing. Nice. Thank you very much for introducing this concept. It's been very helpful. Um, the kind of second wing of my research uh, that I'll be talking to you about, I'm talking to you about tonight as well, is in social cognition, so the theory of mind debate. Um, and then the, the kind of third wing of my research is on the ethical implications of some of this research. And so I've been recently collaborating with a number of other philosophers um, on uh, writing some arguments, some legal arguments, in support of Stephen Weiss's work with the Non-Human Rights Project, arguing for chimpanzee personhood rights and uh, soon for elephant personhood rights by analyzing the notion of what is a person and what sort of capacities you might need to have in order to have a right. And then this goes back to the methodology. How do you study whether or not these capacities are found in various non-human animals? So I'll, I'll try to talk about a little bit about all three of those things tonight. Um, so maybe we can launch the discussion um, now amongst yourselves. Um, do you have any questions for each other that you think would be interested for, interesting for the students? Sure, I do. Since, since we have a philosopher at the table, uh, <laughs> what's your opinion of Nagel? Um, Nagel? Yeah. So Nagel asked a, um, a question that stimulated a lot of people. What is it like to be a bat? Um, it's led to endless questions about what we mean by what it's like. Uh, though I think that we don't really have very good definitions of consciousness or sentience. Um, and a lot of times we default to this what it is like experience when we try to explain what we're interested in. I think that's your fifth, the fifth uh, wing of, of um, ecology is to get at the what it is like, uh, sure. the what it is, ethology, what it is like experience. And I don't know that we've gotten, that we've really gotten any much further in defining those terms. I disagree with Nagel when it comes to this idea that there's a special problem with non-human animals. I think that we've got this problem with humans as well and it's important to acknowledge that because then it allows us to make some of those steps forward when we're dealing with non-human animals. We recognize we've got this problem across cultures, across gender, across across socioeconomic background, these things come into play. Um, so I have a particular ax to grind with that essay, um, and so I will sharpen it here, any, given any opportunity. Um, but I guess, so it's actually, a, I think, actually a, a much larger issue than people may realize um, uh, the influence that essay had. And so if you haven't read it, um, you have to read it. What is it like to be a bat? Um, so I was at, so this was about two years ago, I was at, um, actually it was a writer's conference, and um, at that conference was one of the uh, current Supreme Court justices of the United States. Um, I won't say which one, because um, it was a private conversation. But anyway, um, I went up to him, so okay, so that eliminates um, three. Uh, and it was, at, it was the very last day of the conference and uh, I kind of balled up my confidence to go and talk uh, to this person. I told him what I did. I, I told my trained dogs to go into MRI scanners so I could figure out what, uh, what they're thinking. And without missing a beat, he, he just looked at me and said, oh, Thomas Nagel. And, and I kind of rolled my eyes. Um, I said, oh, I hate that essay. And, he's, and he got very interested. He looked at me and says, oh, really? Tell me why. Um, so probably for about the next 20 minutes, I got into a debate with the Supreme Court Justice, uh, which I was way out of my league. Uh, but it kind of points out the effect that this essay had, which kind of permeates all aspects of thinking about animals, not just animals, but of course humans as well. Um, and the, the point that I finally made, I think, that kind of registered was that sometimes that essay is, is taken far out of context and is used in many ways to essentially kind of throw up our hands with, when, it comes, when, when it comes to non-human animals and say, well, we'll never know what it's like to be another animal, so 
uh, you know, we can treat them in ways that you know, we assume that they're not feeling anything or not thinking anything or not really having any sentience at all. Um, and so that was kind of the point I made to him, which he finally acknowledged. He said, oh, okay, well, that, I guess, makes sense. Um, so part of my point is, is that a lot of what I'm doing is showing analogous responses in, in at least dog brains to human brains under similar circumstances. And the question of what it's like to be a dog, we, we're not going to get there 100%, but we can't get there 100% with each other as well. But if we can get there 90%, I mean, that's pretty good. Um, and it, it, it's not symmetric in the sense that a dog's not going to know what it's like to be a human. You know, but through various means, we can approach 90, 95% perhaps on you know, that animal's experience through a variety of, of techniques. The, the limitation, I mean, I, I think Nagel's limitation was with the um, sensory modalities. So it's the echolocation of the bat that he was emphasizing. And I don't know, do you think that you're going to get close to knowing what it's like for a dog to smell its own urine and identify itself through that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, the, so the examples that Nagel used, the, the bat in particular, was the echolocation and the flying bits. So the flying bits are, are done because, you know, people jump off uh, mountains and buildings with wingsuits and they are basically human bats. Mm -hmm. So those people know what it's like to fly like a bat. And the echolocation, um, I think echolocation is, is not that foreign to us anyway, um, because a anyone can walk into a pitch black room and get a sense for something about the size of it just from the acoustics. So, so I don't think these are fundamentally different. And, and it's because we're mammals. Um, he, put, he should have picked a more different animal um, to make the point. But the, I guess the point is we are, will always be limited in knowing other species, but also other conspecifics as well. And the standpoint of epistemologists today in philosophy would take Nagel's article and emphasize the fact that, yeah, this is true of humans, as opposed to the way you're treating it. No, we can actually get really close. We can, of course, we can get better, and we can get better and worse. It's not going to be me putting on a suit, a bat suit, the way Nagel described it in that, in that uh, article. Like, oh, I can only imagine what it's like for me to be a bat. I can get probably further away than that. But there's always going to be this limit, just like it's always gonna, there's always going to be a limit for you not knowing what it's like to be me in my body, in my female body, me not knowing what it's like to be you in your own lived reality. We can talk to each other and try to get close. We can use art and, and um, cinema and so on in order to try to tell these stories. But it's never going to be perfect. So give up that idea that we need to be perfect. And let's try to approximate what it's like to see things from the organism's point of view. Yeah, I think this is a great uh, discussion and uh, reiterates uh, uh, an important point that even with each other, our private experience is not totally private. And that's why I came up with that term. Uh, and we can get partially there, and we get there more often in some species and in some contexts and others. Our social life would not uh, exist if we did not have some way of uh, knowing most of the time, I mean, not accurately, how, what is somebody feeling as a response to something? Are they, being, are they, gonna, are they violent? Are they angry? Are they happy? Uh, we make these judgments all, all the time. And if we're really good, sometimes with a colleague or a friend who seems to be acting normal to most people, but we can see something's really bothering you today, isn't it? Or something, right? So through our close observation of people, we get insights that others may not. Similarly, somebody who really knows their dog very well can make a prediction that others uh, uh, cannot. Cross species, I remember Bernie Rollin, who's a philosopher who wrote a lot on animal rights, but <laughs> who is a character in some respects, but he uh, made the comment that, you know, as a male, I can't really understand female orgasms. But when I see, a, but I can't know much more what a baboon 
orgasm is like than I knew what a I can't specifics females orgasm is. So I have more connection then with the male baboon in that context than I would with a, uh, a human, human female. And you use that as an argument that we can know more in some cases about uh, uh, other species and their emotions or feelings than we might uh, with other, other, other humans. Um, talking about a philosopher that goes out and, uh, st and studies their animals, one of the people, friends of mine who did this quite a bit is Colin Allen, who studied pigs. He decided he to be a philosopher in this area. Uh, there was a movement, I don't know if it's still around, called experimental philosophy. Uh, and so he studied pigs. He wanted to get, uh, uh, he was a cognitive ethologist, worked a lot with Mark Beckoff, and wrote some important uh, papers and books. Uh, so uh, I really, I think encouraging to see philosophers and the psychologists and the ethologists sort of collaborating and looking at the same phenomena from, from some different and complementary perspectives. Hear that, students. <laughs> <laughs> Can you ask a question? Of course. Okay, I've got two questions. Both of them related. Uh, do non-human animals have a theory of mind as we understand it uh, in humans? And it would seem that they do. Most, mo most of the talk seemed to go in that way. And if they do, uh, what sort of difference uh, do they have in their theory of mind? And are the cues different? We talked about dogs. They don't have outward facial expression uh, to, to exercise that theory of mind. And as you said, it becomes very instinctive, uh, very intuitive in human to know what other people are feeling, even when the face is showing nothing but simply knowing the person. So does it work the same for non-human animals? Is, is it a specific characteristic of humans? And uh, if it's different, what sort of thing can we, can we experiment to know the difference. I'll let uh, you answer uh, that, except there are uh, stories and indications that sometimes a dog has an indication of the emotional or the state of its uh, owner, um, and others in the family might, <laughs> might not. You want to say something? Uh, sure. So, uh, I used to think more about theory of mind when I started studying the dogs than I do now, actually. And the reason I say that is I kind of think less of the distinction of what theory of mind is than I used to. Um, and the reason, so, so let me explain. So uh, I, the way I'm thinking about this now is more of a continuum. Um, so a dog, for example, could have a theory of behavior. Right, so, so what do I mean by theory of behavior? Well, that's, so a dog could, could look out at his world and kind of see how the other dogs and other people act and develop kind of very elaborate models of his world and predict how, how the other beings uh, behave without necessarily developing kind of a model beyond that uh, that those beings have, you know, a mind like I do, or maybe like the, uh, a mind like the dog himself has. Now, this could be extremely elaborate, um, and probably is, to the point where it would look like a theory of mind to outward experiences. And so, if that's the case, then the distinction between theory of behavior and theory of mind is not particularly relevant any of more, anymore. I mean, I could have a very elaborate theory of behavior of everyone in this room um, without resorting to the fact that I think you think. Um, and it would probably serve me well in, in kind of most of the things I need to do um, in, in daily life. So, so that's kind of where I'm at with theory of mind and theory of behavior. I'm thinking of, of it. Theory of mind probably evolved from very elaborate theories of behavior where it kind of just became a, a, a matter of computational efficiency to make that next jump um, and just make that assumption and kind of build it in to our models. Um, so I think it's a matter of question then, uh, you know, where other animals lie on that spectrum. Yeah, so I, I, I don't have 
very strong feelings about this either, and I, I don't know about the debate itself to what, how much, how deep it can go. I mean, so as a behaviorist, I know behavior. I know what I see, and I can document that and describe it and think about, you know, potentially uh, models to explain behavior at different levels of complexity, right? And I'm wondering if this idea of theory of mind is really just a heuristic and an easy way to explain these phenomena, right? It's just a label that we've attached us up to streamline the process. But in all of our behaviors is really a complex series of stimulus response properties. I mean, I could, that's how I frame it. It's quite boring way to think about the world, but I, I think about it in that way. And so, um, you know, explaining other people's behavior, I just think about, you know, how they respond to my behavior, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't have to use those words. And so I think it's, a, it's, it's clearly a very influential idea and an important idea to think about, but I, I just don't know how to experimentally uh, address that question. So, go ahead. Uh, you, okay, well, I have a long... Okay, well, let me just make a quick interjection here. Uh, on the theory of mind, uh, uh, building on sort of skepticism uh, I hear, is as I recall, uh, Stephen, you would know this, uh, you were editor of Behavioral and Brain Sciences, I think when that first article by Premec and his associates came out. Uh, Premec and right. draft 19. And I wrote a commentary on that, mm -hmm. and one of my points was that I don't know if the chimps had a theory of mind, but it was Premac and Associates. They had the theory of mind that they were imposing and, um, uh, uh, under a system. Uh, they did nice experiments and so on, but I think there were uh, uh, problems, and those uh, now, after all these decades, are starting, I think, to be, uh, uh, be, be exposed. We start looking at these things more, uh, more, more closely. Uh, no one, of course, has asked whether a uh, uh, a bearded dragon has a, has a, has a theory of mind. Uh, and I'm not, and I have to go along with John, I don't know if that's a useful question even to, to ask. And I think that uh, we need to focus on specific phenomena and not try to come up with these general kinds of uh, uh, overarching uh, frameworks and then get into all these heated arguments. It's like language, you know. Uh, as a certain point, let's get on and do some research and get away from arguments. Yeah, it, it, it depends on what you mean by theory of mind. So Premack and Woodruff, when they defined the term, they really wanted to know, do animals, this is a quote, I believe. I can't give you the page number, sorry, I forget that. <laughs> but I believe they said something like, do, do chimpanzees do what humans do, namely attribute states of mind to others and use that to predict and explain behavior? So that's very different than this idea of a theory of other people. A theory is pretty complicated, and so when we started talking about theory of mind in human children, and Alison Gopnik created the theory theory, I'm like, that's really sophisticated. Here's a kid all by herself creating a theory about human behavior when scientists mm -hmm. need to work together and collaborate <laughs> to construct theories. So there are disanalogies with this whole use of the idea of theory. If the question is simply, do other animals respond to conspecifics and um, other animals as if they are minded beings? Do they, do they understand what others can and can't see, for example? Do they understand that others have, uh, are in different emotional states, for example? Then I think that we can more confidently say yes about a lot of species um, and not just mammalian species. I, I don't know. This is what I'd like to hear, from, hear from you. Do you think that the bearded dragon has any sense that, uh, or the crocodile, has any sense that another crocodile or bearded dragon or their in the bearded dragon case, not the crocodile case, their, their human is um, happy or sad or playful or any kind of a mood or emotional recognition. Well, well, well why would it be, I, I think you have to ask, why would it be relevant to them in the first place to, I mean, would that to make a difference? Yeah. Well, let me give you an example of an experiment we did uh, a long time ago and uh, on hognose snakes. Now, hognose snakes, uh, I had to cut that out of my talk. It's one of my favorite topics. These are animals that, uh, with a predator approaches them, uh, they respond by rearing up and striking as if they're a venomous snake. They never open their mouth, though. It's all bluff. It's fake. If that doesn't work, if the predator there, or the human or dog is still there, then they go into, they start writhing and turning all over and really rapidly, and then all of a sudden, stop. 
the heart stops beating, or they stop breathing, the mouth opens up, blood comes out, their anus is raised, shit may come out the other end, uh, and uh, they look, the, you can pick them up, they don't move. The, the only flaw is that if you turn them right side up, they immediately turn upside down again. But, so we were interested, and the idea was that these animals just go in a cataleptic fit, you know, they have no idea what's going on, they're just uh, stressed out uh, through this experience. Well, we did experiments uh, with Harry Green, one of my former graduate students, in which we put uh, a predator, a stuffed owl, overlooking the cave. We, we knocked them out, uh, they went out, and then we looked at how long it took them to recover and leave, because eventually they will. They'll raise their head a little bit, look around, and turn off quickly and zip off. And if the predator was there, they, it took them a lot longer before they recovered. But then we did a human. And uh, I was the, <laughs> was the stimulus, and uh, it was all filmed and everything remotely. I couldn't see the snake or anything. Anyhow, the snake was out. I looked in the direction of the, of the snake, and I was either this way, my eyes, my head didn't move, or I averted my gaze. So I was looking over there, but my eyes, everything was straight ahead. If I was looking straight ahead, and it took a long time before it recovered. If I averted my eyes, it recovered quickly. So that shows a really <laughs> uh, sophisticated degree of sensitivity to the eye position. And I interpreted this in this chapter in the Griffin volume uh, uh, in terms of Dennett's intentional stance. And I said, well, can we then go, is this zero, first, second, third, uh, intentionality? And uh, I don't know what you want to, want to make of it, but it shows that these animals can be very sensitive to stimulus events and uh, process them. Um, I don't know how we're was in thinking about me or not, or, uh, and maybe that's not relevant, but it was, I think, a pretty uh, interesting experiment that you wouldn't have asked if you hadn't thought, wait a second, maybe these animals are really aware. One of the things about snakes, unlike lizards, is they're they don't have eyelids, right? So their eyes are always open. Normally, if an animal is going to conk out, eyes are closed. Well, you know it can't see things, right? Uh, but the snake's eyes are always open, even when it's sleeping. So um, this might be a really dumb question, but I think it's, it could be interesting if you don't agree or it's not gonna be interesting if you agree, unfortunately. Uh, since you all represent one animal class for each other, let's say, Christine, you represent sea mammals because you studied dolphins. Uh, which animal class is the smartest? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because it reminded me, uh, uh, someone asked a question about intelligence this morning, right? and there wasn't really a lot of time to talk about it. Uh, so, because um, I, I get asked this question about dogs all the time, the same question, what, what breed is the smartest breed? Um, so it's a silly question. Uh, so, because we never, the, the, I don't think the question this morning was actually answered on what intelligence is, um, right? Uh, so I'm gonna offer my kind of take on it. Um, and my view of, of intelligence is simply the ability uh, to generalize knowledge to circumstances you have never encountered before. Um, that's just my very general way of thinking about intelligence. Um, uh, so that's how, that's how I answer the question. And then when people ask about the breeds, that kind of stops the conversation there because I'm not, I'm not aware of one breed not being able to do that. Um, so that's, that's my take on it. So that's my way of avoiding your silly question. <laughs> I think the, the debate over what intelligence is is kind of like the debate of what language is, right? So it's, it's I, I don't know where I stand on that. But I think if you, if you make it very specific to a particular task, then I think you can ask that question. So that being said, I don't have a strong feeling. I just know from Gordon's talk that birds are smarter than reptiles. And I think we'll just leave it as that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there is some debate now among the, uh, the bird folks and the mammal folks as to which are overall uh, uh, 
a, a, a smarter, <laughs> more, more intelligent. Uh, at the higher levels, I mean, they have primates and uh, they have birds, corvids doing things that uh, chimps can't do yet. So does that make them smart? I think it has to be context specific. Uh, there was a symposium of, of Wolfgang Wickler, who was the successor to Comrade Lorenz at the Max Planck Institute uh, in Savies, and uh, was retiring. They had a brought together people uh, working with all different groups of animals uh, to talk about his idea of ecological intelligence, and uh, that intelligence was sort of an evolutionarily uh, developed a process, and that animals of all types and plants too could be in, could be in, considered to be intelligence if they sort of survived and were adapted to their uh, to the environments and could continually uh, show some uh, adaptation. So, does plasticity to changing environments? If we talk about that uh, uh, in terms of climate change and what's happening with some species that we think may be better able to handle changes uh, in climate than others. Those who don't, does that make them less intelligent or just less of able to respond in different ways? Just if I can say my take on, on the subject, I think it really depends on the sensory system that the species is using. For example, we talked about dogs that uses uh, mainly the olfactory uh, systems and auditory systems and all that. We primates using the visual cues, etc. So I guess intelligence would be based on what is required for the species to survive in the environment. And if visual cues is not useful, then if you want to say a bat, for example, is not intelligent because it cannot see something, for example, it's just a silly example, but the bat cannot see because it's, it lives in the dark and it uses echolocation, so its intelligence will obviously be different than a human or a dog. Or, and it's obviously dependent on what's your definition of, it, of intelligence. Quick comment on that. Uh, uh, for years, there were attempts to come up with uh, ways of uh, ranking animals on intelligence, and they had all these different types of tests. And one of the ones that came out when it was decided that any specific uh, learning task or conditioning task was not sufficient. What you did is you, uh, and Harry Harlow started this reversal learning and the habit reversals, you train the animal on a series of comparable tasks or reverse what was positive, got reinforced, was now not reinforced, but the other stimulus was, and so how quickly the animal could go back and forth. Uh, the reversal learning uh, was considered to be a uh, uh, measure of intelligence, and that uh, primates are really very good at this. And rodents, when they were tested in a comparable situation, were not rats. Uh, until this fellow, and I just blocked on his name, uh, who did this neat study on olfactory reversal learning in rats, and they nailed that and showed improvements, and they, they learned that really fast. Uh, and uh, so we're a visual species, and this is where the anthropocentrism and so on comes in, and that biases uh, so much of our uh, opinion of, of other animals, and our basic ignorance of the other sensory domains that animals operate in. So in the, in the human case, the measurements of intelligence have a really fraught history as well, and Stephen Jay Gould has a really nice book, if you haven't read it, the Mismeasure of Man is worth reading. Um, because if we have this much trouble trying to come up with intelligence rankings within our species, we should be very skeptical about any ability to do it uh, in between species. As a way of getting a little controversy here, I will uh, suggest you look at Gould's book with caveats in mind and look at some of the reviews and how he misrepresented the data that he was in fact uh, purporting uh, to 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 critique himself. Yeah. To carry on with the others thing, like um, when you do your, your experiments, why do you use dolls like the, the dog doll for the MRI and the, the predator doll instead of using the real animal? Like because like the, I guess the subject would be able to smell the pheromones and it might, would it change the Neural response, you think, or how how would it change it? Like, please. Well, with with the dogs, it was it was a matter of of uh, practicalities um, for a couple of reasons. One, one is frankly safety, um, because if we had a real dog there, that 
that dog would be potentially at risk. Um, well, both dogs could be at risk for a dog fight um, for the more aggressive ones, for sure. Um, but, but part of the problem then is then you think experimentally, okay, well, if we're gonna have a real dog there, we don't really have control over what that dog's gonna do. So we'd have to have a dog sitting there in the MRI room, probably, probably a small dog, probably it would have to be in a crate, kind of just caged there just for the other dog to look at and they'd have to be there for God knows how many you know hours of, of scanning we would have to do and um, it would be different every time so so we kind of just dismissed that out of, of practical reasons and safety reasons um, Yes, that's, that's true, um, but I think it, all bets may be off when, when we're talking about aggression and you know, putting them in a situation where there's resource competition and one dog's getting something and the other dog's not. I mean, yeah, with, with probably a very placid dog, uh, we could probably do it. Um, it, it yeah. <laughs> Let me give you a few historical anecdotes that date me. I was there when um, when uh, Nag is this working? I was there when Nagel gave the talk at Princeton that preceded the '74 paper. Uh, he was in a symposium with David Lewis and I forget who else, uh, Richard Rorty, I think, uh, all giving their own view of the mind-body problem. Um, what was different about Nagel's paper? And it's not what in the end became so influential, I think. In fact, I, I think there's another seed in there, which I'll tell you about in a second, other than the one that actually took root. It, it became this cult of point of viewism, right? Instead of what it could have been. The point of viewism was, by the way, we have um, Jim Simmons <laughs> uh, coming, who's, who was also from those days, and who's a world expert on rats and autocorrelation. He'll be telling you about what it's like to be a bat later on. But by choosing a bat and, and another sensory system, as, as, as Kristen said, um, he kind of swayed the whole discussion away from something that was already known. We already knew the other minds problem was not born in 1974. We knew that uh, it's not possible to know for sure what, what, whether anyone else has anything in mind, whether they have a mind. When you blithely, uh, Gordon said that the two, uh, what was it then, were you talking about um, crocodiles or, or lizards or snakes, the, their minds. I'm with you on that, but, but you're saying something bold when you say they have minds. And it's not the Nagalian point of view that's an issue. It's not even the social mind, and it's not about the beliefs that you're gonna hear from Kristen tonight. It's not about beliefs. It's about what this summer school is about, namely sentience. You can't know whether they talk or they don't talk. You can't know whether an other entity, an entity other than yourself, feels anything at all. That's other minds problem A. Other minds problem B is if they do feel something, you can't know what they're feeling. They can tell you that it's a migraine headache, but, um, but someone can go and do a scan and find out that it's actually a vascular headache or whatever, so, so they don't know that. What was born, what was born out of Nagel's paper was the so-called hard problem, at least the name of the hard problem. People took up what it is that Nagel said, Nagel said you could never know, but he said it in his peculiar way that you could never see something from the point of view of another organism, which was, it's an interesting question, but it's not a deep question. Chalmers took it up and said, well, but actually you can't know whether anything's going on there at all, ever. So to the behaviorists, like John Cicada, I mean, you have a terrific solution there, right? I mean, it's, there's nothing going on. It's just behavior and what's useful behavior, et cetera, et cetera. That's actually a, probably something that Dennett is saying as well. But the real problem is, and it's not our problem as theorists, the real problem is, 
does another entity feel when we can't be sure? And so we, as be good behavior, say, well, the, the data are not compatible with the, or they're, they're, the data that supports the hypothesis that it doesn't feel are uh, much more weighty than the, than the hypothesis that it, that it, that it doesn't feel, than, than that it does feel. So we're going to uh, reject that hypothesis. The other mind's problem is the problem of that other organism when you are wrong in rejecting that hypothesis, as Gordon says with the reptiles. Does that liven things up a little bit for you guys? Obfuscates things. I had, I, I had an answer and I just blocked on. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, I added some slides after our email exchange for this evening where I'm going to directly address this question about whether, um, about the importance of sentience, knowing whether something's sentient and then knowing what they think once you've gotten that and then what to do about it and the importance of, of uh, the fact that animals are sentient and they think this as opposed to that. Um, and one of the points that I want to make is that, so spoiler alert, is that the um, amount of evidence that we currently have for many tax, I think it's true of mammals, I, I would love to see Morgan's snake research come and blossom and more and more stuff on reptiles and more and more stuff on this in birds as well. Um, and um, uh, cephalopods and other taxa. But with mammals, we have an accumulation of evidences of different sorts that can only be explained, the only explanation that explains this, uh, all these different areas of research showing the results that they're showing is that they're sentient and that they feel. And that is the only sort of evidence we have for other humans being sentient as well. The arguments are exactly parallel. I think the language is a red herring because it's just more behavior. It's simply another kind of behavior. Um, I don't find it to be all that special, especially given how bad we are when it comes to trying to explain why we do what we do. We confabulate and make things up all the time. Um, we have lots of audience effects in our own communicative uh, practices. And so once we realize that we've got these problems that are on par with other humans and other non-human animals and we think about how we solve the problem for other humans, that we can solve the problem for other animals exactly parallelly. And then we can move on from worrying about the existence of other minds and then ask these more specific questions about the contents of their minds, which is what you need to know if you care about how you interact with these animals. Because you need to know from their perspective what's valuable for them, okay. what they care about, what they think about. Yeah. You could describe mind as sort of brain action and then by studying brain action. Uh, but I would like to go back a little bit uh, to uh, uh, Stephen's point about probabilities. Because my view of science typically is that uh, we never know ultimate truth, we have probabilities. So almost all our conclusions in science, all those experiments that we do, we do them with a statistical significance, right? It's all probabilities. And so uh, what we're doing is just reducing. Only somehow when we get to the anthropocentric issue, we want to raise the stakes. <laughs> Uh, so that we are not demeaned, or mammals are not demeaned <laughs> uh, by being sort of reduced to some, uh, as, uh, something else. So I think uh, uh, looking at science as a sense of, of, of probabilities and the certainty, and um, Bayesian statistics is a way of uh, uh, using priors and so on to uh, come to better conclusions uh, may be uh, a very, very useful. And Jonathan Birch is going to be arguing for lowering, not raising the law. In other words, so, where there's a possibility of doing a lot of damage by assuming that another, let's talk about your, your beloved reptile. If uh, there were an industry that was doing horrible things to reptiles because people were assuming that reptiles don't feel a thing, Jonathan 
converge with this precautionary principle is going to argue that you should lower the standards because of the amount of damage that it causes if your Bayesian hypothesis is wrong. Mm. Okay. So the other thing that, that Nagel trashed, which is more dear to my heart, is the brain. Um, so part of the argument was, and this is getting back to the hard problem, is what does the brain give you? I mean, if, if we use neuroscience to um, study how the brain works, does that say anything? Does that shed any light on the question of, of sentience or consciousness? Um, so my response to that, and, and I, I deal with this criticism every day, um, which is, well, what does the brain give you that you couldn't get from some other means? And one thing that, that I'll say about um, the time in which Nagel wrote the essay, that was over 40 years ago, and neuroscience um, has undergone an explosion in 40 years. Um, so things that are being done today, um, you know, most of, the thing, most of the techniques that neuroscientists use now uh, were only created in the last 10 years, and it's, it's accelerating at a phenomenal rate. Um, I think within, within my lifetime, certainly within everyone else's lifetime here, um, we will make extraordinary progress in linking kind of the hardware with the software. Um, Certainly with, with neuroimaging, we're already getting to the point where we can decode, decode not quite what a person is thinking, but we can use brain activity alone to decode what they're looking at, um, what, even what they're imagining, at least visually, in the visual system. Um, so it's simply a matter of more data and more powerful AI algorithms to, to figure it out. So a quick comment on that is years ago I proposed that uh, uh, we might be able to set up uh, a brain yoke controls and where we could uh, stimulate another person, part of the same part of the brain that somebody else is uh, experiencing and whether we could use that as a way to get at this question. Do you think there's any possibility in the future that uh, we might be able to sort of uh, yoke parts of brains together and uh, maybe, you know, a sense of taste, for instance, may start there. That well, uh, it's, it's been done with the motor system in monkeys. Yeah. Um, but that's not the same as an experiential thing, like a, uh, a, a taste yeah. or an emotion or something. I think probably. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what the limitation is at this point to doing but, that. But, but could that help solve the hard problem? So the, the neuroscience research is based on an assumption that the, the subjects are conscious. The neuroscience research that's dealing with, with phenomenal consciousness, yeah. I start with that assumption. Yeah. So the macaques and all the non-human animals are already taken to be conscious. So you can't solve the problem if you've already assumed that. No, but, if I, can, yeah. but whether I can experience what you're experiencing, even though I don't have that experience, because the part of the brain that being activated when you taste something or you uh, have an emotional, you see a fearful stimulus or something, does that sort of create something comparable that I can feel? So I was going to say, so the requirement for consciousness is not always clear. So I'm thinking now of Adrian Owen's work in, in comatose patients. So, so Adrian Owen um, did fMRI in at least one patient in a coma, and the idea was essentially to speak to her um, and observe what activity was, was manifest in her brain. Um, and without going into kind of all the gory details, the, the evidence was sufficiently suggestive that um, she was processing some aspects of what was being spoken to her, even though kind of by any objective measure, she was completely vegetative. Um, and so that raised, again, raised the question of, you know, what's going on inside the black box? Is, is what he observed, uh, you know, like the fingerprint or the trace of the subjective experience that she was experiencing kind of in the absence of all the things that we're talking about? 
Yeah, and what, and what do you think? Do you, because I've, I would find that pretty compelling. So in a patient that wasn't comatose, you'd see external markers and these internal markers, but if, because there's physiological damage, we can't, we're not gonna see external markers, but we still see that. That was the clear implication of the work that, yeah. you know, that there, there really was somebody home still. Mm -hmm. What would happen if, if somebody wouldn't have any memory at all? You know, like moment to moment. Would that person still be aware of themselves? Are you, uh, so the question was, what if a person didn't have any memory moment to moment? Would that person still be aware of themselves? So it sounds like you're describing the patient HM. Uh, no, no, not really. No, not, not, no worse than HM. Yeah, probably worse. Would the person still uh, be conscious that they are? If they have no trace in their memory of what they just thought a second ago? Okay, so, so yeah, so HM had memories up to the point of his surgery. He had a trace right. of memory. Right. So he had, maybe his personality, his personality was stuck. Maybe his personality was stuck in those years, but still he had a reference. But if you take that away, does that the person still know they exist? I, I can't answer that question. Yes, <laughs> please um, use the. I think there's there's one question in the back. Okay, so actually, what happens when uh, they lo they lose the memory? So for amnesia. They have a problem um, getting back the episodic memory, and this is the one related to every like uh, emotional or uh, s stimulating experience in, in the life. So for the HM, for example, he, he didn't have access to that memory, so he, he kind of lost the memory of himself. So with all the episodic moments in his life, he didn't know uh, what kind of person he was. So maybe that answers your question. Does it or not? <laughs> Thank you. You might be done talking about um, points of point of view, but um, and qualitative character. But uh, I, I'm having a hard time understanding uh, why we should care so much about qualitative character. Um, I mean, it seems to me uh, we care about animal minds um, partly because of whether a certain animal deserves uh, special moral consideration and partly because we're curious about whether they have minds and whether those minds work. But, you know, consciousness is such a small part of the scientific study of the mind. Um, it's not even part, been part of the scientific study of the mind for more than a few decades. Um, so, in, in a way, I, it seems like we could sort of do without the challenge to see if we can add any sort of phenomenal stuff to the functional description of animal minds. Uh, once we have admitted that there's all this other stuff that animals have, uh, decision-making processes and other psychological functions um, that are the scientific, or scientific kinds that figure in our explanations, should we, do we really need to worry that much about sentience? So Peter Carruthers would say, no, we don't have to worry about sentience at all. Consciousness doesn't matter very much. What matters is whether you're impacting some system that has some sort of goal or something like that. But I can't make sense of what Peter Carruthers says. I honestly can't make sense of this idea. If you're watching, Peter, I just can't make sense of this idea that you can have something that matters to you without having any, any sentience, any sense of, it value, of value. That, so he says pain doesn't matter. Suffering would matter, but you need metacognition for suffering. So, and you know, most, he thinks maybe apes and nobody else 
probably, except for us, has metacognition, and so we don't have to worry about suffering or pain. We don't have to worry about suffering for them. And, and, uh, but we can't just do whatever we want because there's this other argument that I can't get my head wrapped around. Because it, I'm very sympathetic to this Christine Korsgaard point of view that for something to matter, it has to matter to someone. You have to sense that this is something that you're driven towards, that you like, pleasure. This is something you don't like. It's aversive. It's a pain. And that's what is the basis of all value. So without that, I don't get moral standing. The question is whether the pain and valuing need be conscious. Yeah, I don't understand what it means to talk about unconscious pain. I like, I just, if you can help me understand that, that would be great. Uh, so I understand that I can be a soldier and I can be shot in battle and I don't feel any pain or I don't notice the pain I'm feeling. That's the way someone like Carruthers would talk about it. I don't notice the pain I'm feeling. I don't notice the damage. I'm not aware of the damage, but I'm not in pain either. I don't need any pain meds. I don't need any analgesics. I'm working just fine. I'm functioning fine because I'm not in pain. If I'm in pain, then I'm not going to function just fine until you give me some analgesics or something. Uh, I, well, I, I'll, I'll tell you okay. about unconscious pain. This comes from my days as a medical doctor. Um, so there, there are many procedures that we do on people where we give them dissociative anesthetics. Um, so they're not they're not unconscious in the sense that you know, you're doing something on a person and they're screaming in pain um, or they're moving in pain, uh, but they have no uh, remembrance of it when you're done. So is that unconscious? This, uh, I mean, this is basically how you do a colonoscopy. Yeah. Uh, so, well, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go back to the consciousness question. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so it's, you know, it, it, it's like, well, you know, it, it's like when the tree falls in the woods, if there's no one there to remember it, did it happen for the person? Uh, I would say the evidence is yes, it did, because um, even if you don't have kind of the episodic memory of it happening, there probably are neurochemical traces in your body as a result of, of you know, adrenaline and all sorts of stress hormones that would be released that, you know, leave something behind. So it's not like it never happened. It, it did happen. Um, you might not, but you just can't put your finger on it. Yeah. Just a quick comment here. You brought up the episodic memory for the first time, I think, uh, uh, today. And that was one of the arguments used uh, that animals only lived in the moment. They didn't have any past, any future. Uh, uh, so that was the way we could disregard them because they didn't remember anything that happened earlier, which seemed to be so strange to begin with because uh, dogs, a lot of them, they know what happened, happened earlier. But the idea that animals live in the moment uh, now we know that they rehearse things, that they can track their past and maybe anticipate the future. Uh, so that's also, I think, uh, been a great change in our understanding of, of, of animal uh, mentality. And here's how somebody was going to say. Um, I, I would like to, to hear from each of you and uh, what role or function uh, do emotions or primary emotions uh, play in your research? And maybe a methodological role can be, I don't know. But, um, and for Christian, uh, if you uh, what the relation you see between emotion and consciousness, um, emotion, um, feeling, feeling emotional, uh, emotional feelings, and the genesis of conscious. That's all. Your first time. Sure. Um, I guess the question is, how much do I consider emotions in thinking about experiments? I mean, I think it comes into the interpretation of the experiments, right? And so. I mean, as you can probably tell, I'm, I'm far on the behaviorist side. I, can, I 
try to report just what I see, right? And we can make some speculations about what, so for, so for example, Sarah Woolley is gonna be talking in a couple of days about uh, female songbirds and whether or not they prefer to hear particular sounds of, of some males over the others. And this idea of preference is, is really one where it's a behavioral manifestation that they like to hear, they will like work to hear one song over the other. And that sort of behavioral readout is something that we make inferences about preferences, but we're not clear what emotionally would happen to those birds, in, in those birds. But, it, but we talk about these terms, we try to be as, as, as agnostic as possible, but just to talk about the behavior and, and what the potential implications. But I guess this, the short answer is that it's peripherally something that we think about, but not something that's central in, in terms of how we design experiments. In. There are as many theories of emotion as people who want to talk about it, um, really. Um, so I think, I think about the dog's emotions, you know, for all the experiments that we do. Um, and, and my preferred way of thinking about emotions um, is to think about, I mean, first, what is an emotion? Um, it's, it's a slippery slope to define it, but I view it as, um, a state that the organism has that uh, biases um, their actions and decision making and behaviors in a way that's not just stimulus response. Okay, so it's it's a way you know it's like I'm hungry. Okay, I would consider hung, hunger an emotion because that you know sets my um, internal state such that I start seeking out food. It's not a particular program where I go after a piece of food. Um, it's just a global state. Um, so the important thing about that is, is that I view emotions as forward-looking. Um, they exist um, to help an animal you know, choose from all the things that it could do at that point in time and kind of what's in its interest. Um, it's, it's kind of our human tendency to view emotions as retrospective. Like, I felt a certain way when something happened. Um, that's a, I think that's just a very kind of human um, uh, labeling of, of an internal state when the, the fundamental purpose of emotions is, is to put us into a state to do something. Um, and that is the function in, in, in all the animals. Um, so, so that's how I think about it. The, the breaking down of the, the nuances of the different human emotions obviously gets very problematic um, when you start projecting those on other animals. Um, but it is something that I, I think about kind of constantly. Um, what is it that we're seeing in the dog's brains when they're reacting to, to situations that we set up? Um, is a dog feeling happiness? Is a dog feeling sadness? These kind of just even at the basic kind of level that most people call basic emotions. Um, I talked about jealousy. I think jealousy, or, or if we want to get into semantics, probably something like envy, um, maybe very basic emotional responses to every animal. Every animal that um, sees a conspecific have something that they want. Um, well, that's pretty important for pretty much every animal on the planet um, to be able to evaluate the circumstances. and we. We know what that feels like, and it's, it's probably a very similar um, feeling in many ways for, for other species as well. So yeah, emotion is a, a very complicated issue and uh, not something that I think is going to be resolved uh, soon. Uh, there's debates, for instance, whether feelings and emotions are separate or, or should be talked about uh, uh, together. Uh, there's arguments as to the different nature of Damasio and so on, of the primary emotions versus secondary versus uh, tertiary emotions. So jealousy or guilt may be considered a fairly uh, advanced, derived emotion as uh, going back to Watson, you know, and a fear and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and love and anger is sort of the three primal emotions and then everything is de developed from them. Uh, in my behaviorist uh, uh, training days, uh, there was a lot of discussion about emotion, but it was always under CERs, Conditional Emotional Response. So this is the way sort of the behaviorists uh, 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 dealt with emotion, and basically it was due to prior reinforcement histories that would uh, lead to behavioral manifestations that you would say uh, uh, re resembled uh, emotion. Uh, I mentioned earlier Kabonik's uh, work on um, sort of consciousness and where emotions is, and he tried to bring together 
series of uh, types of evidence to argue that emotions f of any type first started with reptiles and amphibians and fish didn't have emotions and he used a number of uh, examples, uh, preferences for, for food and uh, uh, emotional fever um, was uh, an example. He said, well, you, you find it in reptiles, you don't find it in amphibians under comparable conditions. Illness induced aversions to food that you avoid, we showed it in snakes, people have found it in reptiles. He claims it doesn't occur in, uh, in, in amphibians. So he was trying to make a case using multiple lines of evidence, all of which I think are, can be, are suspect, uh, but nonetheless an attempt to sort of come up with objective evidence to uh, make, draw some lines. I don't know whether we can ever really do that. And now that uh, fish in many ways are considered to be really smart, and some fish have huge brains, uh, by the way, for the body size. Uh, I think these kinds of things are going by the wayside. So I think an evolution perspective is what we need to uh, uh, take into account. You mentioned multiple lines of evidence for sentience in mammals and so on. Uh, what about evolution? How do you, uh, what's the high probability that evolution actually occurred? It's very high because of all the multiple lines of evidence and the fact that it seems to be the only th way to explain lots of phenomena. No other uh, uh, theory or perspective seems to be able to, to do that. And I think we might be trying to get to that uh, level with uh, looking at some of these issues, but it has to be through, I think, an evolutionary perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so, Insofar as pain is an emotion, and sometimes, this is the way I hear a lot of people talking about pain as an emotion, everything we said about pain can just be, I mean, not everything, but the same sort of issues can arise. So we can look for externally observable markers of emotions, both in external behavior, including verbal behavior, internal behavior, in terms of physiological states, chemical states, and, um, and we can make inference of the best explanation arguments when we see this across species that the same sort of affect is going on in the other, uh, in the other species as well. Uh, what I kind of want to ask Greg is, uh, so we've got, you know, the Ekman's facial action coding system that identifies musculature movements with emotional states in humans. And we have a chimpanzee version of, of facial action coding system, which is purports to do the same thing for chimpanzees, and there's a lot of similarity because of the, the shared um, morphology between chimpanzees and humans. But I recently discovered there's a dog fax and a cat fax, but what the disclaimer said on the webpage that I looked at is, we make no claims about emotions, this is just muscle. So is there any, is there any movement to be interested in trying to come up with an emotional version of the, the dog fax? Um, yeah, so, uh, so I don't know, uh, kind of, I mean, because it's relatively new. Um, I think they just published the results like in the last year. Mm -hmm. So I think we're all kind of um, scratching our head to decide what, what to make of it. Um, because, it, it, you know, it's, it's humans coding dog expressions. Um, so, so we have to kind of look at that and decide what that, that means because um, it, it may be us projecting what we think we're seeing and they may be signals um, that the dogs don't care about or dogs or there are other signals that dogs use um, to communicate with each other as well as us that we're not we're not smart enough to know yet what what those are mm -hmm. um, but it brings up kind of the interesting point um, you know, since you bring up um, Ekman, I mean, these are these are manifestations of these are external manifestations of emotional states that we supposedly recognize. Although, not all of us are very good at, at the, the Ekman faces. Um, in fact, a lot of people have problems with with certain ones, um, and so that's a very kind of distinct thing, which is um, the the expression of the facial emotion and then kind of our ability to recognize it. And that's distinct yet from the internal experience of the emotion or the, the, the use of that emotion to deploy a set of behaviors in the real world, if you will. Com very complicated. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a question? Oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Can I ask you another question, Greg? 
Um, I, so there, I've read a couple of studies. One was um, Mark Beckoff, and then I don't remember who did the other one a couple of years later on the urine yeah. version of the mirror self-recognition task. Yeah. Do you have any opinion on that's Horowitz, that? I think. Yeah. Was it Horowitz? Yeah. That's a new one. Okay. I, Beckoff did the, the first one yeah. and of one. Um, uh, yeah. So Mark Beckoff. So so. Mark Beckoff. Yeah. So um, the original version of it was: Do dogs recognize their own urine? So I think he followed. I think it was his own dog around where uh, the dog marked the snow um, in Colorado and just observed whether the dog sniffed places where the dog had previously marked versus other dogs, and and he didn't. So that was kind of Mark interpreting that as well. Okay, the dog recognizes his own scent, and that was kind of the start of the olfactory version of, of the mirror test. Um, and I believe the more recent version that Alexandra Horowitz did was kind of a version of that, but she adulterated the urine with something. I can't remember what it was. And, and I think she was claiming that, um, that the dogs sniffed more when their urine was adulterated with something. Does that sound right? Do you know, Gordon? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so again, it, it, it kind of leaves questions unanswered because I don't know if that had the control for just an adulterant itself. Um, um, it's a reasonable way to approach it. And in fact, I was kind of interested in that when we did our olfactory tests in the dogs where we presented them with their own scent. Um, nobody asked me about that. Um, we didn't, re the, the brain response um, outside of the olfactory bulb didn't really, it kind of flatlined for the dog's own scent. Um, that's not terribly interesting. I mean, you know, honestly, we're all kind of immune to our own body odor. Uh, so it's just there all the time. So there is kind of rapid habituation that goes on with olfaction. So I don't know that that, that answers it. Um, but I'm surprised no, while we were talking about theory of mind, nobody brought up the, the question of self-awareness because those two usually go together. And I'm not sure we want to go down that road yet. At the lunch, the three of us today were talking a little bit about uh, this, an olfactory self-recognition or olfactory mirror test, and I pointed out that there are experiments, uh, uh, Zulema Tang Martinez and by David Chazar, arguing that uh, uh, snakes have a, uh, a strong preference, uh, recognize their own odor. Uh, and when you put a snake in a new cage, clean cage, immediately goes around and, uh, and defecates it because you want to make it smell like home. And so the more you clean the cage, the more you're stressing the snake out, actually. Uh, but they did experiments then by putting the snakes in uh, uh, other snakes' cages or their own cage and so on, and showed that they, uh, using tongue flicking and various behavioral measures, uh, they seemed to definitely uh, recognize uh, their own versus the uh, other. And the, uh, going along with what you said, they tongue flicked less if they were in the, as I recall, in the, uh, in the familiar. It was as if it was with a strange or different uh, animal. That, then they were much more agitated and responsive. Uh, we have about 12 minutes left, so maybe try to get the remaining questions. Okay, quick question, uh, no quick as well questions. as complicated one. That's my specialty. <laughs> uh, I heard uh, many sort of definition of sentience uh, relating to information. I was specifically trying to get what exactly you call <coughs> sentience. And I, I had four, I saw four. Information being registered, as in uh, an op a colonoscopy, you know, you don't go under, you do uh, have consciousness during the thing, but you don't store the information, that's the second one. First, you perceive, that's one type of, of sentience. You store information, seem to be another type. Uh, information contextualized, seem to come back quite a few times, the information must be adjusted at the very moment the decision is made, seem to be another one. And the last one, because of the question, information that is felt, that has caused uh, a feeling, emotional response. Those four seem to be four ways of thinking about sentience in human and non-human animals. Uh, which one you think is the best one? Do you think they should go? Uh, and and then together, or do you think we're still uh, anthropomorphism uh, our way around? Yes. 
I don't think the information part of those four definitions, I don't know that anyone meant anything about information when they talked about sentience. And I wouldn't use that word in, the, in my description of sentience. I wouldn't want to define it. I think Stephen should define it because he's the one who, he's the, yeah. He's the one who, who named the summer school. So he's got to know what he's talking about. <laughs> Do you think that the ability of an animal to be conscious of his own state of mind precede the ability of the same animal to uh, project a state of mind to a conspecific or vice versa? Do you think that uh, from an evolutionary perspective, an animal is before able to project a state of mind before to be conscious of his own state of mind or the other way? Do you, do you understand my question? or? Uh, What is this, your gut feeling about that? I don't know. I don't have a view on this. Peter Carruthers has a view on this. <laughs> um, he thinks that, that social cognition comes before metacognition, and he gives an argument. He's got a long BBS paper on that. Um, Peter Carruthers. I mean, I, I don't really have kind of an evidence-based answer for this. My intuition says that, that um, all animals probably have a basic ability to define the, the boundaries of their physical body. Um, they, they, I'm not aware of any evidence of animals confusing their body with a conspecifics. Um, so there's just a very basic kind of, that's just an attribute of being Uh, an independent organism that you have a limit to your physical body and it seems that that goes hand in hand with a nervous system that controls the body. So I think probably all animals have kind of some boundary between self and in the, in the environment as a basic attribute of being an animal. Um, so that would lead me to, to hypothesize that self comes first in kind of a very rudimentary fashion. But that's My, just my guess. Be conscious of his own state of mind is different. Be conscious of his own state of mind is different than to have a state of mind. I don't, I don't know if you. Well, I didn't get into the state of mind. I just said uh, uh, an awareness uh, or some ability to control the physical body uh, that that distinguishes the animal's body from the outside world. Uh, so to me, that is the basic of self. So maybe I should say something that uh, doesn't make uh, reptiles look too, too smart. <laughs> you tell, like, give me an example. <laughs> just knowing the body, you see, knowing the size of your body. And so there are numerous cases where uh, a snake will go through a fence or something into a cage, <laughs> eat a chicken or an egg or something like this, and then not be able to get back out because it's now much fatter around, because you know, a snake can swallow a prey uh, up to almost their body, uh, their, their body weight uh, in, one, in one meal. And uh, so there are instances where somehow a, a snake will not necessarily know how, and it's not adaptive because it gets caught. Uh, I've seen uh, a snakes in wire that they couldn't you know, get, get, get out of, or a predator can then come and, uh, uh, and, and get them and so on. So knowing the state of your body is, I think, a fairly sometimes a complicated uh, calculation to make sometimes. <laughs> We have time for one last question. That's an honor. Thank you. Um, my question goes to um, Mr. Borgard. Um, you showed some pretty interesting videos. The one that caught my, my attention the most was the depressed turtle. The turtle that was basically showing a bad case of depression, it was self-mutilating, yeah. or at least self-harming itself. Mm -hmm. um, it reminded me of those parrots, or, or the, those birds in pet shops that basically take away Feather all their, picking, yeah. right? Um, it, is that like just an anecdotal case, or do you know if there are other cases documented for turtles doing that? Because I thought that was pretty, uh, 
Well, that was a pretty dramatic case of uh, African soft shell, and it was apparently uh, going on for some time uh, because you could actually, if you look at the video carefully, you'd see on the side of the animal uh, heel scars and so on were. Uh, I do not know. Uh, we know that lots of times animals will try to escape and they'll rub themselves raw, their faces and stuff like this, uh, snakes, and uh, if they're not in a good environment. Uh, so we do know that animals will get, uh, will harm themselves. Uh, but how many studies of, of this type? Uh, I don't know. All we know is that we gave the animals these objects and uh, started manipulating and being very active. Uh, and just like with kids, uh, you want to rotate the toys. You're not keeping them there all the time, right? Uh, uh, otherwise, they, you know, Same just <laughs> they ignore them after, after a while. Uh, and um, so I can't say that this is, there's a field of dealing with reptile depression out there now. You being the expert, you never heard of other cases. Uh, I do know of the cases where animals are injured themselves in the, these environments, and, uh, and parrots and some of these birds are really uh, known for this feather plucking. And We are at the end of the panel. Any last words? <laughs> this was fun. Yes, very interesting. <laughs> Thank you.